peak at 16,000 feet in the Himalayas. Frozen for most of the year, it hides a deadly secret. The skeletal remains of hundreds of people. Who were they? Where did they come from? And how did they die? The origin of the skeletons of Rupkund has been debated for decades. Now, for the first time, an international team seeks to solve the mystery of Skeleton Lake. Countdown to its biggest religious event has begun. It's an annual pilgrimage in honor of the Hindu goddess Nanda Devi. The priest starts to shudder. It's believed that he is possessed by the spirit of the goddess Nanda Devi, who is now revealing her messages to her devotees. Nothing dominates the life of local people more than their fearful reverence for Nanda Devi. She is believed to be both a fiery destroyer of evil and a gentle, demure bride to Shiva, the Hindu god of destruction. The annual pilgrimage retraces the steps the goddess is believed to have taken to her husband's home higher up in the Himalayas. Each year, the procession trudges up to a meadow that's not too far from one of the most dramatic natural formations in the area. Surrounded by jagged cliffs, swept by chilling winds, shrouded by fog, immersed in an aura of forbidden mystery, lies the Rukun Lake, 16,000 feet above sea level. The pilgrimage winds its way to Bedni Bogial, a high-altitude alpine meadow. It's here that an animal is ritually sacrificed to appease Nanda Devi. There is a shadow that hangs over the devotees. It's the shadow of death. The weather can turn treacherous within minutes here. It can even kill. There are many stories told here of divine vengeance, sudden death, and the working of mysterious curses. As the clouds roll in and the sky darkens, the rocks and mountain faces seem to acquire a haunting life of their own. It's almost as if the elements are conspiring to shield Rupkund Lake's secrets. There are many such secrets became apparent in 1942 when a forest ranger looking for rare Himalayan herbs strayed onto the edge of Rupkin Lake. He made a grisly discovery. Professor William Sachs teaches cultural anthropology at Heidelberg University. He speaks two Indian languages and is happiest walking in the Himalayas.
His love for India has led him to name his daughters Leela, the divine play, and Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. These are common Indian names, just like Nanda. For nine months, Professor Sachs has coordinated a multidisciplinary scientific investigation. An investigation that he hopes will solve a mystery that has haunted him for over 20 years. I first went to India 26 years ago as an undergraduate and I wanted to do research on pilgrimage in the Himalayas. So while I was doing my research I found a book in the library which described this fantastic pilgrimage up to a huge height in the Himalayas for the goddess Nanda Devi and along the path was a lake surrounded by hundreds of human bones. I thought that this was really fascinating and interesting and I really had to go there. At National Geographic Channel's invitation, Professor William Sachs finally gets to lay at rest the ghost that has haunted him for two decades. He agrees to lead a team to the lake to solve the mystery once and for all. In New Delhi, he meets two members of the team. Bone collector, Professor Rakesh Bhatt of India's Gardwal University and paleopathologist Dr. Pramod Joglikar of Deccan College in West India. <laughs> Professor Sachs gives them an idea of the terrain. Today, the route to the lake is pretty well mapped out. But for early expeditions, the going wasn't that easy. The Indian government's Department of Anthropology attempted to reach the lake in June 1956. They got within a couple of kilometers of Rupkund, but a heavy snowfall prevented them from reaching the lake. Two months later, they returned to try again and finally made it. The samples they collected were dated between the 12th and 15th centuries, but technology in the 50s had a large margin of error. Since then, although lots of visitors have collected bones and artifacts in the area, no comprehensive tests have been done to solve the mystery of Skeleton Lake. But many different theories have surfaced. Were Rukin's dead, a lost army fell by the elements? Were they pilgrims seeking to get closer to the goddess Nanda Devi? Did a large group of people commit ritual suicide here? Could a group of traders have got hopelessly lost and perished? Were these victims of a terrible epidemic? For 60 years, Skeleton Lake has not revealed its secrets. Now, it is up to Professor Sachs and his team to make the dead speak. When an Indian forest ranger stumbled on hundreds of human remains on the shores of Rukin Lake, he had no idea that he would spark off a search for answers that would last 60 years. The team packs for the expedition to Rupkund in the Himalayas. They'll have to brave bad weather, high altitude, and inhospitable terrain. And they'll have to constantly think like detectives. Who were the people who died at Rupkund? When? And how did they die? What were they doing so far away from civilization? The team leaves Delhi for Gwaldam, where the five-day trek to Rupkin starts. slides make the going tough. 
What's usually a 15-hour journey takes over 40 hours. Finally, call them. That's what you call the long round. The expedition prepares for the arduous trek ahead. The air is going to get thinner. The weather will be unpredictable. Villages will be left behind. Food will be scarce. The team needs to be entirely self-contained. Dr. Bisht, a Himalayan geologist, joins the expedition. He has participated in many high-altitude expeditions. His experience may be useful. The porters lead the way to an ancient Nanda Devi temple. As Professor Sachs prays, he can't help but remember that devotion to Nanda Devi is sometimes taken to bizarre extremes, including ritual suicide. Over a hundred kilometers away from Rukund, there are inscriptions on the temple walls that seem to describe an ascetic's intent to offer himself in a ritual sacrifice to Nanda Devi. There are those who believe that Rukun's remains are those of holy men who committed ritualistic suicides. The expedition sets off. It'll take five days to get to the base of Rukund to final camp. In a way, leaving Gwaldam is like leaving civilization. For Professor Sachs, this is a chance to get reacquainted with a region and people he has come to know and love. He will also get a chance to test his pet hypothesis. As a cultural anthropologist, my work is based very solidly in local understandings of the world, in beliefs and practices and rituals, songs, myths and legends. And according to this form of collective memory, the bones that lie at Rupkund are those of a party of pilgrims who disappeared there many centuries ago. Now, of course, that's not the only theory. Outside experts have suggested other theories as well. And what this research is all about, this expedition, is about collecting samples, subjecting them to scientific tests, and seeing which of these theories holds the most weight. Professor Sachs has spent years looking for clues in folk traditions. The words of the song spell it out. They have been handed down over generations. As far as these women are concerned, there is no doubt whatsoever about who Rupkin's dead were and why they died. The king of Kanauj came here on a pilgrimage to please Nanda Devi. He brought along his queen even though women were not supposed to go beyond Bedni Bugyal. He even brought dancing girls with him for his entertainment. Nanda Devi was furious with the king for breaking the rules of the pilgrimage. So she created a blizzard and rained down hail which wiped out the entire procession. That king of legend was called Jasdaval. His failure to resist earthly pleasures of the flesh provoked the goddess Nanda Devi to strike an awful revenge. The story locals believe until this day is that the king and his entourage were all killed by a torrent of hailstones, huge and as hard as iron. According to legend, this is the ridge where the king Yashdavl made his dancing girls dance in the snow for his entertainment. The words for dancing girls Patra and Nachna means dance, so the place is called Patra Nichornia, all along here. 
Now, according to some people, the goddess was so angry with this that she made the she turned the dancing girls into standing stones along the ridge. But others say that she pushed them down into the underworld, into Patal. And there are several pits in the area. Here are two of them, where the passage to the underworld is said to be. modern team of scientists has a different passage to make. A passage through the many competing theories about what really happened at Rupkund. As the expedition climbs higher, the landscape at least seems clearer. Trees give way to meadows and grassland. of the expedition members are a swirling mass of questions. Anticipation mounts as Rupkund comes closer. Five days after the trek began, the expedition reaches Uniathal at an altitude of about 14,190 feet. Base camp is established. From here, Rupkind is only a three-hour trek away. I'm feeling pretty optimistic. I'm feeling great, but the, uh, the big question is the weather. We really need the weather to hold so that we have adequate time to do our excavations and uh, find as much material as we can. I think we should explore that area first. The team plans its first ascent to the lake. I think we should explore that area first. The weather at Rupkund is known to turn dangerous around noon with powerful winds and plummeting temperatures. The team will have a window of not more than four hours at the lake each day. Planning is needed to ensure the time at the lake is well spent. The night passes in eager anticipation. Ascent begins at first light. It's a steep, hard trek, made harder by rarefied air. But the team pushes on. On the way, the weather keeps everyone guessing. For a couple of hours, it's clear, then out of nowhere, fog rolls in. It's easy to imagine how people could have got lost here. Some believe that an ancient trade route to Tibet once passed through these parts. And the Rukin's dead were a large group of traders who were on their way past the lake when a blizzard hit them. With no shelter at hand, they died a cold death on the icy slopes. In order to demonstrate this theory, we would expect to find, first of all, um, Tibetan artifacts, clothing, jewelry, that sort of thing. We wouldn't expect to find uh, women and children. We'd expect it to be an exclusively a male party. We'd want to, of course, find some evidence uh, of a trading route, of a path in the area. And the most important thing, because trade here is mostly carried on the backs of sheep and other pack animals, you would expect to find lots and lots, dozens or even hundreds of pack animals. Past and present weave inexorably together as the team finally arrives at Rupkund. They cross a ridge and begin the steep descent to the lake. It looks like a jewel, ethereal in its beauty, but sinister in its tranquility. As soon as we got up close, we could see that the whole landscape there is littered with bones and skulls and pieces of flesh. 
You can hardly take two steps without stepping on a, a piece of flesh or a bone or a skull or something. There are literally hundreds of bones here. But over the years, curious scientists, fascinated pilgrims, and intrepid trekkers have taken away a large number of them as souvenirs. Professor Sachs is understandably nervous. These are like, you know, all these hundreds of bones. But the sheer well, number of skeletons has led many people to believe that an army perished here. Lots of these samples. It's believed they were on their way to conquer Tibet and were unprepared for the altitude. Caught in bad weather and weakened by disease, it's believed they lost their way and died. If it was any sort of army at all, we would expect to find weapons. We would expect to find helmets and other sorts of military gear. We'd expect to find horses. And the fact is, of course, soldiers uh, have lots of wounds, they have lots of injuries, and so we were looking for bones, skeletons, which would show evidence of past military wounds. The team begins its investigation at the bottom of Juragali, or the Path of Death. We're standing here halfway between Rupkund and Junagali. Juragali is the summit up there, which is the highest point of the pilgrimage of Nanda Devi. Once in 12 years, the Nanda Devi pilgrimage travels over this ridge and ends at Homkund. It last took place in the year 2000. Professor Sachs believes that the steepness of the terrain provides a crucial clue. What I think is that a lot of the bodies have been washed down from that point and over time they've basically slipped down here. That's why we have this huge mass of bones all around. And so this is one of our likeliest sites. The team goes into action. Samples are collected and sealed in airtight bags. These samples will be examined in laboratories around India and Europe. The question is, will the weather hold out long enough to allow the team to collect enough data to study? We had beautiful weather when we got up this morning and made this trek up here, but as soon as we got here, the weather got uh, a bit nasty. It's getting foggy. We can expect some rain or some snow, and uh, in any case, we have to leave by 1 o'clock or by 2 o'clock at the very latest because it gets too dangerous to stay here. Working in the shadow of Rupkund is like working in the shadow of death. The weather can kill here as it might just have killed hundreds of people whose remains rest in the area. As the wind picks up tempo, the rain starts coming down. The team scrambles back to camp. The night brings no respite. We had a bad storm all last night, it was raining and blowing, but we woke up to very clear weather. Unfortunately, there's fresh snow on the path up to Rupkund. Now, we can probably reach the lake, but the samples are likely to be covered with snow. However, it could be really dangerous getting down because of the slippery path. So, we're just going to wait. Early next morning, the team returns to the lake again. Excitement mounts as the team makes a series of discoveries. A copper ring, broken pieces of glass, maybe writing or some painting. There's a piece of wood here. A piece of wood that could have belonged to a musical instrument. The search continues. I got nothing here. See, this is arrowhead. Beautiful, beautiful. Wow. This is definitely Ispia. Fantastic. Iron Ispia. With bamboo. With a bamboo rod, you know? The finding of an iron spear is incredibly significant. Never before has a weapon been found here. Could this have been an army after all? 
The team collects many more clues, but they just don't seem to add up. A piece of leather. Not like a local party sample. Yes. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of leather chapels, leather slippers, and actually here, Dish found what looks very much like the woven top of one of these parasols. These four pieces are for Chantoli. Like the ribs of the Mandela. But all this was a build-up. A build-up to an incredibly startling find. There might be a, an animal. Let me check. Let me see one more. For hundreds of years, a body has lain under the rocks, remarkably well preserved. Will it help uncover the secret of Rupkin's dead? Painstakingly, piece by piece, the body is dug out. Can you make a guess about whether the body was broken in two before death or after? It's the post-mortem killer. Why do you say that? If there is some rock falling over a body, then bones will get crushed, bones will be broken. But they will still remain inside the skin bag, mm -hmm. outer skin portion. Then in that con condition... Dr. Joglicker explains that the bodies could have been scattered by landslides years after death. In other words, we have no... But how did they die? It's not in the immediate area. Should also try to get a fairly the body they just found gives him uncontaminated tissue samples for DNA testing. So where will you take the DNA samples from this? I think I choose this from the hip portion. Mm -hmm. One sample. Maybe another sample I pick up from the calf muscle there. The scientists need to be very careful. There are hidden dangers lurking in these remains invisible to the naked eye. They could prove fatal. If these people had any diseases like tuberculosis, leprosy, pneumonia, plague or any of this, these germs also would have survived in this. So a researcher should maintain certain distance so that uh, through aerosol, that means through air, they do not enter into the body. Though Dr. Joglikar doesn't realize it, he has inadvertently touched upon one of the earliest theories relating to Rupkin's dead. According to one theory, Rupkin's dead were victims of an epidemic. Their bodies were moved far away from their villages to prevent contagion. Over time, hundreds of bodies were carried to the lake and dumped in it. Icy waters preserved them till they were found. Flesh that could be hundreds of years old is cut open and tissue samples extracted. Each sample is labeled and packed in a sterilized vial wrapped in ice to preserve it. It's a long journey to a laboratory in South India. Hyderabad Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in South India is a leading DNA testing center. Dr. Lalji Singh's job is to identify through DNA tests where Rupkin's dead came from. To do this, he will match Rupkin DNA with DNA data from across the world. Back at Rupkin, the team is barely coming to terms with the incredible discovery of a preserved body when they chance on something even more interesting. I found something very interesting here. Look here, this is some skull fragment yeah. which has got some sutures. Sutures? It shows that this skull is of a younger person. Younger, how young? Uh, perhaps there's an old. Less than 10. This is sample number three. This is a crucial piece of evidence.
when we discovered the bones of the 10 year old adolescent child this really brought home the human dimensions of the tragedy to me I found myself thinking about what it must have been like in the last few moments or hours of life mothers and children huddled together up in the snow and ice freezing to death perhaps drowned in an avalanche or pelted down by hailstones this really was a colossal human tragedy beyond my own feelings about the event what the discovery of these bones did was to count pretty heavily against the army theory because it is highly unlikely that medieval armies would have been traveling with young children in Rukund the expedition's work is over they've made some remarkable discoveries and collected bags full of valuable remains these will be analyzed in laboratories and will help Professor Sachs and his team solve the Rupkin mystery. Two months have passed since Professor Sachs returned to Heidelberg. It's been a difficult time for him. He must now begin to discard theories in the same way a detective eliminates suspects in a murder mystery. To do that, he needs to know whether Rupkin's deaths all occurred at the same time. And if they all did die together, when did they die? Oxford, England can answer both these questions. Dating tests done in the 1960s had established that Rupkin's bones belonged to roughly between the 12th and 15th centuries. But technology wasn't as advanced then as it is now. Dr. Tom Hyam has just finished testing the bones using the state-of-the-art procedures at the radiocarbon accelerator unit. Tom Hyam's findings overturn assumptions that are half a century old. Those who died at Rupkind perished in the 9th century, thus predating the original analysis by at least 300 years. Well, we found is that all of them are older than a thousand years. In fact, they all cluster to within the 9th century AD, much, much older than we actually thought they were going to be when the samples were originally sent to us. Tom Hyam has also found the answer to a second critical question. Did all the deaths occur at the same time? The answer is a fantastic yes. What we could be dating here are people that died instantaneously within hours of one another. They certainly weren't a population that died over a period of many centuries or even many decades. It's far more likely when you look at all of the information that we've obtained up until this point that what we're looking at is a single event and that's what we're radiocarbon dating. These findings change everything. According to Tom Hyam, all those who died at Rupkin died in a single event at some time during the 9th century. Meanwhile, Dr. Bisht concludes his geological study of the Rupkin area. Dr. Bisht rules out the possibility that a pass to Tibet ever existed in the Rupkin region. The Tibetan trader's theory was always relatively weak because we weren't aware of any trading route in the area. However, we thought that we just might be able to establish the previous existence of such a route. And once Dr. Bisht told us that there was no such route, then this theory lost whatever credibility it might have had. The trail is getting warm. In Heidelberg, Professor Sachs finds it difficult to kill time. He still needs to hear the findings of some tests. Dr. Willimbe, a paleopathologist, and Dr. Bhattacharya, a physical anthropologist, have been working with Dr. Sachs's bones, as they put it. 
They are now prepared to reveal what Rupkin's bones have told them. Rupkin material brings out two very divergent forms which is not normally found together. One is a rugged, tall variety with long heads. The other is a medium height, lightly built, round-headed form, which is very divergent from the tall varieties. Most of the skulls have a depression at the same place on the vault of the skull in the middle region. Possibly this was because these short-statured people were the porters who have been carrying weight on their back with a strap holding on the head and that gives the depression. And since these are found only in the smaller statured group, it's possible that they were the local porters and they took a group of outsiders in. There were both men and women amongst Rupkun dead, aged between 18 to 35 years. There were old people too, 55 plus. There were also teenagers and children. Apparently they are healthy people, even old people don't show any sign of disease. Rupkin's dead are finally beginning to talk. They are acquiring flesh and blood. It may yet be possible to reconstruct what happened in those icy Himalayan wastelands 1200 years ago. Picture them, at least two ethnic groups. One, long-boned, tall, and almost certainly not from the area. The second, shorter, more delicately built, and possibly from the region around Rupkund. A huge cross-section of people, men, women, older people, teenagers, and even children. Anywhere between 300 and 700 of them. Science throws up something else. It would seem that the taller and more robust ethnic group had a large number of people closely related to each other and even shared a minor genetic abnormality. We also observed some genetic uh, anomalies here. For example, these are intersutural bones, Warmian bones. Careful examination reveals that several skulls had extra bones. These could only be a result of a rare genetic abnormality found in close blood relations. I have seen an abnormality in skulls that belong to the taller group. It's not a coincidence. It's an abnormality seen primarily in close relatives. But who were these people? What were they doing in such large numbers in the middle of nowhere? And how did they die? <laughs> Professor Sachs is on tenderhooks. The phone finally rings. Hello? It's Dr. Lalji Singh, India's leading DNA specialist. Yes, I've been looking forward to your call. Dr. Singh's report is in. The DNA of the Rukin dead matches what is found in most Indians. More importantly, he says that many of the individuals had matching DNA. This validates Dr. Walambe's report that close family members were among those who died at the lake. Professor Sachs has been able to establish that a large group of men, women and children traveled to Rupkand from the plains of India. They were definitely visitors, but accompanied by a group of local people who served as porters. But that does not explain what they were doing here and how they died in one overwhelming catastrophic incident. For most of the last 50 years or so, I think most scientists have assumed that they died in some kind of a landslide or avalanche. Um, I think partly this is because it's an avalanche prone area, but also because a lot of the skeletons were found under certain rock falls and they were found in positions which suggested that they were victims of an avalanche. But then Dr. Valimbe made a very important discovery. Professor Sachs would probably never have been able to establish the cause behind the hundreds of deaths at Rupkand had Dr. Willimbe not made a startling discovery. In a moment
moment of decisive insight, he realized that the popular landslide theory that had dominated scientific thinking for six decades is demolished by close examination of the bones. It's very clear that they didn't die of any disease. They were not murdered. They didn't kill themselves or die in a landslide. If any of these were a cause of death, then bones would have revealed it. But what do the bones say? They tell a different story. And the story is pretty incredible. What the bones reveal is the fractures of the skull that could have killed them. The very fact that some broken elements are still attached to the skull indicates that incident must have occurred at the time of death. A blow by object like a stone of the size of cricket ball can cause such an injury. Can Rupkin's weather and topography provide a clue? Incredible though it seems, the area around Rupkin is known to be regularly hit by large hailstones. Could a massive hailstorm have killed the travelers at Skeleton Lake? No. For centuries, women have sung of an ancient tale of how the Hindu goddess Nanda Devi, angered by her devotees, rained down a storm of hail as hard as iron, killing them all on the spot. Now, science supports what ancient folklore has always said. Through our scientific studies and through a process of elimination, we've gotten rid of the other theories and we're left with a version which matches what the local songs and legends say, which is that many centuries ago, a group of pilgrims perished up at Rupkund due to some catastrophe. To me, the most striking bit of evidence is what Walinde has told us, that many of those people died by being struck with hard objects on their skulls. Even this small detail matches what the local songs and legends say. One year after Professor Sachs and his team visited Rupkin, they are reasonably certain they know what happened on that fateful day about 1,200 years ago, when a large group of over 600 people was winding its way past Rupkin Lake. Most certainly pilgrims of some sort, closely related, outsiders traveling with their families and children. They were accompanied by many local people who probably acted as guides and porters. Although it's impossible to establish beyond reasonable doubt precisely where they were going, it is clear that they were unprepared for what was going to happen. weather changed, grew ominous, the sky darkened, the wind picked up speed, there was thunder and lightning. And then the hail came down, there was nowhere to run, no place to hide. They clambered over slippery, treacherous terrain, clinging to each other, desperately looking for respite. It never came. became decades, and decades, centuries. Landslides broke and scattered the bodies, pushing some down slippery slopes and into the lake. Frozen in time and space, preserved by ice, the skeletons of Rupkind have always aroused fear and awe. Now, for the first time, they have been able to tell their story. want to 
be remembered in death, and these people certainly have been. They were properly buried by their families, their graves attended with love and affection. But what about those people at Rukun? <laughs> Hundreds of people dying, men, women and children, in some catastrophe up in the mountains. Did their families know that they died? Did they know how they died? Will we ever know exactly who they were? Will we ever know their names? Probably not. You know, I've lived with this story of Rupkun for more than 20 years. And now, I think I've answered my biggest questions. Mm -hmm.